question. Um, I want to um, first um, apologize for, for uh, Dr. Lisa Cooper not being able to join us today, but um, it's good to see you all. I'm, I'm Deidre Cruz. I've met many of you, but i um, really delighted to um, to uh, introduce our, briefly introduce our speaker today, who's going to tell you um, more about his work uh, once once he has a, has a chance to uh, to sort of take the, the virtual mic here. Um, I want to give, um, as we often do, I want to, um, I'll give a little bit of a, of a um, more professional type of, of uh, introduction to Dr. Johnson, and then we'll go into some fun facts uh, about him. So, um, so first, uh, Dr. Otis Johnson Jr. is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Social Policy and STEM Equity here at Hopkins. And he has faculty appointments in the Department of Health Policy and Management at our School of Public Health, as well as at the School of Education, where he um, serves as Executive Director of the Hopkins Center for Safe and Healthy Schools. Um, he, and he also um, has an appointment in the Department of Sociology. Um, he has a number of different leadership uh, positions, including directing the um, National Science Foundation Institute in Critical Quantitative Computational and Mixed Methodologies, or the ICQCM, and he is the co-editor of the Sociology of Education uh, Journal, which is an, a journal of the American Sociological Association. So um, we uh, have gotten to know uh, Dr. Johnson um, a bit over his, his now short time that he's been here at Hopkins, and um, uh, he was kind enough to share with us a number of uh, fun facts about him that uh, we will we will do some polling with the audience around. Um, so first is um, Dr. Johnson is a an award winning artist of a particular craft, and I want people to have a um, opportunity to guess what his artistry is. What is his artistic talent? Feel free to add it in the chat. And then we'll let you tell the story, Otis. <laughs> so, photography, one vote. Music, okay. Do you, all right. Pottery, <laughs> I like it. We've we've had we had a previous speaker who had had a who throws pottery. So dance, origami, I like it. The one that would affect. Okay, poetry. <laughs> so. For for let's see, Stacy Davis who said music. Let's build on music. Which which what type of music? Um, I'll give you that. Oh, that's my hint to you all. Let's build on the music idea that Stacy offered. The, a specific instrument, the saxophone, the harpsichord. <laughs> this is a little bit of a show of who actually knows <laughs> knows a lot of instruments. So. <laughs> Drummer, singing, violin, jazz, jazz musician, huh? Opera, okay. The you know, there, the there, flugelhorn. There, there is uh, a winner there, but I that's not the instrument I named. That's not the instrument you named, but there's a winner. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's a winner there. Okay. All right. Well, Otis, why don't you? The suspense is killing us. Why don't you tell us about your? Uh, no one said piano. Talents. Yeah. <laughs> no one said piano. Uh, but yeah, violin as well. All of my my uh, um, scholarship tuition scholarship was on violin. But I ended oh. up I ended up being piano performance major. Awesome. And tell them about your high school honors that we were all. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, one state twice on for my uh, high school division in in piano in my sophomore year and my junior year and I lost my senior year. <laughs> uh, I know you remember that person's name. We we don't have to call out their name. <laughs> we know. I know you remember whoever that was that, that dethroned you that year. So I remember the judge. <laughs> oh, okay, or even better, or the player. I don't know. <laughs> awesome. In the great state of Missouri, as I learned to say when I was uh, in Missouri. school. <laughs> so, very good. And then, um, so uh, Otis is also the, uh, is, a, is a pet parent of, of two types of dogs. So this is a rare, I would say, rare to me uh, type of dog. So I want to give people an opportunity to see if they can guess the type of dog that, that Otis has. Dogs, because he has two. Okay, Dobermans. I said it was rare. Okay, whip it. Okay. Oh. 
Wow. Cane Corso. Don't know mm -hmm. that one. And Akita. Yeah, Allison, you've been invited to, to jump in. They said, because you're our resident. Close, Rhodesian <laughs> Ridgeback. The Rhodesian Ridgeback is close. For those who mm -hmm. really know dogs, then you then maybe have at it if you if you can. No, uh, my dog, my dogs are 80 pounds each. Large yeah. dog. Okay. Yeah, large dogs. For people like me that don't know much about dogs, it's okay. Large. All right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the great pyrene pyrene pyrenees mm -hmm. the great pyrenees the okay mm -hmm. so it's still not here it's still not here yeah they're not gonna i have two red bone coon hounds <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> now the you put it out there now, wow. i'm gonna ask i'm gonna ask our center our team at the center if they could if you can produce um a, a link in the chat for what a red bone coon hound looks like um, we would, we'd appreciate it for those of us that, that, um, I'm sure have never seen one or didn't know it when we saw it. Um, that would be terrific. So, and then we, we learned that, um, I had to be taught this because I don't, I don't watch this particular show, but, um, there's a popular show, lots of people watch it. And, um, uh, in this show, when when Jon Snow killed the mother of dragons, uh, <laughs> Otis yelled at the TV. What show was that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it, it's just abbreviated. Yeah. See, this is this shows you how little I watched the show. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, wonderful. Well, the well, thanks for thanks for playing, everyone. Um, we look forward to seeing what a red bone coon hound looks like. Um, but without here we go. Without Alex, without further ado. My screen? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> we can. Here we go. There. <laughs> oh yes. Mm. Beautiful. I didn't know that's what they were called. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Johnson, without further ado, we, we welcome you to uh, the Center for Health Equity Jam session. Look forward to, to hearing from you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can't share my slides, right? Here we go. Yeah, you should be able to. And let's put this. Well, thank you so much, uh, Deidre, for the uh, uh, great introduction. And yes, everyone, please forgive my music choice. I it it was jam session, so I thought, of course, you wanted a jam. So I picked Beyonce uh, with all of the the colorful language. So my apologies if I uh, offended anyone. Um, I want to thank. Um, uh, the Center for for uh, Health Equity, definitely Dr. Cooper, um, for inviting me to share some thoughts with you today about the measurement and modeling of macro racial discrimination, um, and really focusing on systemic structural uh, and cultural racism. Um, this was my opportunity to make more concrete many of the ideas I've shared on the topic over the last few years. Um, and in my NIH research collaborations with Margaret Hinken, um, Hetty Lee, Sarah Zanton, and Roland Thorpe, uh, and work with, with Michael Russell at, at Boston College. So I really appreciate this moment. In fact, that thinking has already led me to move beyond the title of the talk that I initially suggested, uh, because structural and systemic are not the only forms of macro conceptualizations of racism. Um, so I, I uh, um, um, before I get too far into the weeds, um, I, I wanted to clarify that, that this slight um, title change, but, um, I also should clarify or at least put up front my argument because as we get into the weeds, you know, some of the details uh, might be a bit distracting. But um, moreover, um, we should consider that racism research 
um, has relied uh, on the mere aggregation of individual level experiences with racism and symptomology uh, to affirm the existence of macro level forces instead of measuring those forces directly. So part of the uh, aim for this presentation is to um, ask questions and to think about how we might measure systemic, structural, and in this case, cultural racism um, directly instead of just inferring about their behavior. Um, there are critical questions of construct validity that must be engaged as we move towards scalable practices of racism measurement and modeling. Um, again, I think along the uh, within the, the literature, you're going to find racism meaning many different things. And of course, uh, when you get to an empirical definition um, of those um, uh, differences, they, they really come to fore. They really matter. Uh, they really determine uh, exactly what you're talking about and uh, the knowledge that you're creating. And there are forms of racism that together create an ecology of racism. So I want to talk about the broader structure of racism, not structural racism, but the structure of racism. And so I think there are many ways in which uh, we can think about this as an anatomy of racism or uh, a built environment of racism, just some other ways of conceptualizing the fact that um, um, there are many um, different aspects and components to each one of the forms of racism and that in some ways are interrelated. That interrelation is key to modeling and measurement. So we'll get into some um, uh, um, discussions about nestedness uh, and uh, cross-classified effects uh, and how to uh, jointly um, uh, conceptualize and model these intersecting racisms. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that critical quantitative computational methods can advance innovations in racism measurement and modeling because I sense within our work and within the academy, within research, our research apparatus, that there is some sort of normative resistance to racism work. Um, unfortunately, it tends to suggest there needs to be a higher bar for inferences when it comes to uh, race and racism work. Um, Whereas, you know, social capital can be anything these days. <laughs> but the point here is, um, um, in order for us to make any ground uh, in terms of the equity work that this type of knowledge could support, it becomes key and really uh, 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 critical that uh, we do rigorous work and that that work challenges um, some of the fundamental assumptions of our fields. So I'll begin here. Last week, Daryl George was suspended again for having the hairstyle you see here. Daryl was first suspended by Barbers Hill Independent School System, a suburban school system near uh, Houston in October. Since he refused to cut his hair after his suspension was over, Daryl was sent to an alternative school for the month of November with the provision that he could return to his original school on November 30th. Once he returned, he was suspended again for 13 days. And after that, will likely be sent to an alternative school again if he does not cut his hair. While the school principal claims his hair is in violation of the school dress code, it is nonetheless a form of cultural policing and anti-Blackness enshrined in statutes and codes of conduct. I share this story because I have been interested in not only documenting racial disparities in student criminalization, but also exploring the social forces at play in the environment of disciplined students within their school environment, sometimes within their neighborhoods as well. Um, this was the motivation of one of my most recent studies with Jason Debar Jabari entitled uh, Suspended While Black and Majority White Schools. We questioned um, whether math test disparities between Black students who had and had not been suspended changed as the percentage of white enrollment increased using um, an NCES database of nationally representative U.S. high schools. 
As you can see in this depiction of our regression in which in-school suspension or ISS was interacted with white enrollment, there's very little difference between suspended, which is the red line, and non-suspended students, the blue line, in their math performances within schools that have low white student enrollment. So looking at the middle uh, uh, depiction is the whole sample. If you see zero, that means there's zero white, a percentage white enrollment. And you can see that the difference between suspended and non-suspended students in terms of their math outcomes is pretty similar, insignificantly different. But as the percentage of white enrollment grows, the math scores of suspended students become significantly lower. Disaggregation of this analysis according to race reveals that the significant difference what we just observed was due to the interaction of ISS and growing white enrollment for black students. So when you're looking at that first um, depiction there, you see that as the percentage of white enrollment increases, the, uh, the average math scores of those kids that have been suspended, which is the red line, starts to decline relative to the black kids that have not been suspended until within predominantly white uh, schools, there's a significant differences. There's significant difference. So while we can argue that suspension is not good, it's not a good thing wherever it occurs, there seems to be something protective for suspended students in majority black schools that supports their math outcomes in a way majority white schools do not. And as you can see uh, with the white sample over here, um, while it looks like a pretty large difference, um, those differences are insignificant. So an alternative thesis could be that something psychosocial is going on here for black suspended students. After all, perhaps uh, kids who struggle with academic subjects like mathematics are more likely to disengage, distract others, and thus get suspended. So we ran a similar analysis uh, with math efficacy beliefs and discovered only white suspended kids had lowered math self-efficacy beliefs. In fact, the math efficacy beliefs of the Black African-American sample appeared especially resilient. You can see it here uh, to your far right. Uh, suspended kids um, seem to be approaching significantly uh, positive, more positive uh, math efficacy beliefs than those who had not been suspended. Um, so, and of course, uh, for uh, the white sample, we actually do see a decline and it is um, a significant decline. So we were puzzled um, and we took the analysis a step further. We decided, well, perhaps there is differential selection into these schools according to white enrollment that explains the difference. So we ended up estimating counterfactual models in which we equalize the probabilities of attending a majority white school using machine learning estimated inverse probability of treatment weights. And we found the same thing. Significant math score disparities between suspended black youth and non-suspended black youth in majority white schools and no evidence that lowered math efficacy was the reason. And once again, I have the same marginal estimate depictions here, which show that uh, to the right, um, that yes, there is, um, uh, at least in terms of, of math test scores, um, a decline um, when those schools uh, are 60% or more white. <laughs> So, uh, and again, with math efficacy beliefs, same scenario. So they pretty much match the threshold analysis that we had earlier. And so um, we ask, but <laughs> why? Why is this? Um, you know, we screened out prior inequities in learning and efficacy and their social determinants by including measures of prior efficacy in learning. So this is pretty stringent modeling. 
Um, we also accounted for differential selection into schools with these machine learning uh, uh, propensity scores um, and achieved uh, treatment group balance. So that wasn't the issue. And those propensity scores were estimated with quite a few things, uh, including urbanicity, neighborhood safety, crime, family uh, uh, structure, household structure, language, disability. So we included a lot of relevant pretreatment um, covariates into the estimation of those propensity scores and achieved balance. And so we're, we're pretty sure it's not due to differential selection into these school types. We tested both learning and learning beliefs to check it to make sure beliefs weren't the reason why the actual performances were lower. Um, and then even in the analysis, uh, we included relevant covariates and conducted robustness uh, analyses. Um, so the models are pretty comprehensive. Um, so there has to be something else going on. Is it, is the culprit cultural? Is it racism, both or, or something else? And more importantly, what is its relation to predominantly white systems, whatever this culprit is? And here I should note the limitations of the analysis. Um, these data do not have a question about racism, so we couldn't include it in the model. Um, but perhaps more importantly, um, the study and almost all others with racism implications do not measure systemic or structural racism directly. We look to these students and their experiences and we see these differences in learning outcomes and we infer that it has something to do with racism. Um, but in fact, we have not directly measured the things that for which we are making the inference. Instead, we merely, merely infer and because of that, um, we perpetuate what is an ecological fallacy. An ecological fallacy is attributing behaviors and impact to units of analysis based on what you observe in a different unit of analysis. You are not directly observing or even putting in place proxies for the unit of analysis that you're making an inference about. Um, so a critical question is how do we move beyond the ecological fallacy to measure and model social forces such as these that reproduce social and health disparities more directly? There have been um, since, I want to say 2021, but perhaps earlier, um, much ground covered on answering this question. Uh, we now have at least four racism constructs and have um, that have led to empirical analyses of, of racism with, with pretty um, uh, important findings. Of course, um, at the interpersonal level, there, there have been advances in, in racism scales. There's the Sioux scale, the, the REMS, the REMAS uh, microaggression scales, um, and there are countless other uh, uh, scales of racial trauma and so forth. So we have made progress in that way, but it is largely about interpersonal racism. It is often not looking at system structures and cultures um, more directly. And I'm going to get at that later because some, uh, I, I'm not saying um, totally that without exception, um, but moreover, I do believe we can characterize the, the research base in this way. So we have systemic racism just to um, define these uh, for you. So um, systemic racism uh, includes systems of dominance, power, and privilege um, based on racial group designation. Um, in my own work, I've been thinking about the institutionalization of racial marginalization within um, society's key social, political, and health systems um, that end up perpetuating racism and really the, the type of social stratification that we um, uh, 
recognized generation after generation after generation uh, seems to be enduring. And so systemic racism is something that we might locate within um, agencies, within institutions like schools, within policing, within health care facilities and um, um, access. So systemic racism is something that we also can relate to policies. Um, so I wanted to put systemic racism in context, and I'm sure there are many other ways um, that it could be defined, but I think these definitions will help us later on when we try to understand the structure of racism, which is inclusive of systemic racism. Then there's structural racism, and it's a macro level system, social forces, institutions, ideologies, all of these things that interact uh, to generate and reinforce inequities among racial and ethnic groups. And, um, you know, it, it, some people might try to understand or, or ask a uh, uh, chicken or egg, right? Uh, you have individuals that are actors. They are real moral agents that could act or enact racism. Um, but then you have these systems and structures that are one step beyond the moral agent uh, uh, conceptualization here. Uh, it's here where um, these systems take on a life of their own. And um, I'll give you a good example. I don't know if it's good, but I'll give you an example of, uh, of how this might happen. So think about individual, individual police bias and stereotypes. And let's say that individual police uh, bias or stereotypes lead to higher arrest rates for specific minoritized populations. Those higher arrest rates in an area are concretized by data science and statistics into objective indicators of neighborhood crime policies then alter the system of, of policing to respond to those indicators, thereby making it a systemic disposition toward race. Um, Over-policing, predictive policing, racial profiling, excessive force are some of these ways in which systems then change. System technologies bring added layers of systemic efficacy around these commitments with their own independent inequities, such as facial recognition software, which, you know, NIST and, and uh, 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 Bellowemi and, and uh, Jabru um, uh, had found that those those uh, uh, systems had error rates as it relates to race and, and gender, uh, more likely to be false when those populations, those particular intersections uh, were uh, estimated. And then there are predictive policing algorithms out there, and they're actually being used by police uh, agencies like in Tampa. There are drones, there are military grade armaments secured through the 1033 programs like electric, electric shock shields and um, the LRADs, which is really a sound cannon. And that sound cannon was uh, developed uh, back after, right after or in response to the USS Cole bombing in Yemen. So these are military grade things that now are uh, fortifying our police agencies. So you can see then how uh, interpersonal racism is then made a system uh, process that then justifies armaments to the level of a 1033 program. And so that's how we then move from interpersonal to systemic and structural. But there's also, um, you know, the upside of this. I, I really appreciate the work of Sarah Zanton and Roland Thorpe and their colleagues um, in, in thinking about structural resilience, meaning those things within uh, our structural fabric that um, uh, can support families and support individuals, especially um, as they contend with the type of social forces that tend to disadvantage minoritized populations. So in this way, we are beyond individual level resilience. We're beyond, we're, we're actually talking about ways in which um, structures can become ecosystems of care, or at least have some of those features um, that could in a way support 
um, um, uh, uh, minoritized groups as they experience marginalization in its various forms. But then there's cultural racism. And um, this cultural racism uh, uh, conceptualization comes from uh, one of my colleagues, Margaret, at University of Michigan. Um, and in this case, cultural racism creates a social environment in which Black Americans bear the stigma uh, and the stigmatizing burden of their racial group while white Americans are allowed to view themselves as individuals. Um, I know there is some more recent health-related work that, that talks about this, but actually it comes from the work of Michael Dawson at the University of Chicago decades ago. And at that time, it was called Linked Fate, the fact that African Americans felt that they uh, were in this together. Um, actually uh, led them to think about uh, harms or how others within their culture group may um, um, uh, transgress or offend some of the logics of conformity that white uh, power has put in place. Um, and therefore any transgression against those logics of conformity um, are actually felt by the entire population because they fear uh, what may come of those um, um, those those outcomes. And some people, um, some other uh, scholars, I'm thinking about uh, the scholar at University of Maryland that talks about um, uh, vicarious uh, experiences with law enforcement, Brunson, last name is Brunson, um, same concept there is cultural, that somehow uh, there is a frame, a cultural frame of reference that's in play um, that applies to African Americans, but not white Americans. And I want to locate this way back when, right, <laughs> in the 1980s uh, with, with John Ogbu's work when he talked about the cultural ecological model. And in this case, you have structure, but structure, culture, and agency is this, this triad where uh, culture um, um, extends from um, structure. For example, um, Let's say that you are in this race and you have this baton, um, but the race you see is unfair because everyone else has already received their baton and they're, they're off to the races, right? Um, culturally, you can have the frame of reference that um, um, this is what happens to people like me. Um, and the sense of fairness, the relative deprivation, all these other mechanisms then form a, a cultural frame of reference. Now, with that cultural frame of reference, you have agency. Now, agency in this case, it could mean that uh, you decide you, you're resilient. You're going to try harder. I'm going to take this baton. I'm just going to have to run faster than them to catch up and hopefully win. Or it could be oppositional culture, could be, hey, this is unfair, so I'm just not going to run the race. And so you see how structure, culture, and agency then are is this this in this uh, uh, intersecting and um, uh, uh, jointly determinative process um, by which culture is created. And in this case, we can put structural racism as the structure and put cultural racism as the culture because that belief um, is now at play when white individuals may not have that particular belief because the structure is not there uh, to support it. And then agency, they may come up with totally different uh, decisions subsequent to the culture and the structure because, again, those things are are uh, different for them. And so, um, I've been doing some work recently with some colleagues at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, where we've looked at the voluntary interdistrict choice corporations. Uh, 
um, uh, busing program. Basically, kids from St. Louis are provided the opportunity to um, um, enroll in schools within the suburbs, which are uh, uh, definitely have higher white enrollment, much like the um, um, study I just reviewed with you earlier. And, you know, some of the outcomes are really, uh, and really sad, but, but understandable within the cultural racism framework. For example, um, these families, when sending their kids to the suburbs for schooling, uh, made notable sacrifices to access opportunity. Um, and it's it's always troubling when uh, families feel like they must trade dignity for opportunity. Um, they lost commute time, of course, because this, or not lost commute time, but they had loss of time because of commutes. Uh, they had um, fewer social ties, the kids did, within the schools that they were attending, and then also within their neighborhoods because they were not um, building those relationships with kids um, during their school times, the kids that went to local schools. And then there was increased exposure to racially charged interactions. I want to turn your attention to the rightmost uh, box here. And this really brings home the cultural racism point. Um, Black families uh, 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 did not see their sacrifice, either in terms of health, because it was a true stressor, uh, even though they used words such as depressed, uh, um, because they felt it was part of the Black, this is what Black people do. This is what um, you must do if you're African American to, you know, get these access, get access to these resources. They felt that it was par for the course. Um, and so in this case, the normalization of health stress or stressors, social stressors, uh, that can cause um, um, health or lowered health outcomes or problematic health outcomes or less ideal health outcomes um, is considered part of Black culture. So now that I've kind of gone through all of these different um, cultural forms, um, I, I want to suggest that there's a structure of racism. And this is when we get into um, some modeling, uh, some understandings of and, and assumptions of each one of these racism forms. And so I'm going to talk about it within the ecosystems uh, framework, Bronfenbrenner's. And I'm going to talk, uh, talk about it in terms of its nested nature and leaning heavily on multi-level statistical methods and then also moving into cross-classified uh, uh, random effects modeling or those, those kind of considerations for um, um, uh, uh, jointly nested and, and, and intersecting nested data. So ecosystems and nested structure racism classification. So first, just thinking about ecosystems and Bronfenbrenner, we have the interpersonal racism and you might think, you know, some people may have other hypotheses about this, but you would think it's it's located or nested within cultural racism. And by the way, we could also put on this, uh, the, you know, classic um, Bronfenbrenner ecosystems classifications of, um, you know, uh, immediate uh, to more distal. I think he used meso and macro uh, types of, of structured order here. So you got interpersonal racism is the most immediate. Then you have cultural racism, which might be some affinity group uh, uh, type of culture that uh, is oppressive because white logics and white ideologies are the ones that created this culture. And then systemic racism, which would be your institutions, um, and then structural racism, which might be your broader societal organization stratification of race with white dominance and then other racial groups uh, falling below. Um, here, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that there are there's a lot of difference um, within these how these uh, 
uh, forms of racism are stacked or conceptualized hierarchically. Uh, for example, Michael Russell in his new book, uh, Measuring Racism, um, uh, locates the structural within systemic because it's within these systems that you have the classic um, uh, social organization of race happening. So it's not like you go in the system and then only systemic things are happening, right? Um, you actually go in schools and you see the same structural arrangement within the school. That is his argument. Or you go within uh, corporations and you see the same, or healthcare institutions, you see the same stratification that happens in broader society. It also takes place and is rooted within systems. So he thinks of structural racism as something happening within systems. But then there are others like Sarah Zanton and Roland Thorpe and, and, and their team um, think about structural racism as a constellation of systems where we can come up with a macro estimate of structural racism by taking all of the systems such as policing, housing, education, work, and um, understanding their impact, their processes and impact. Um, it's that constellation of systems that actually form society's broader structural arrangement. So again, this is not as neat and tidy uh, as it could be, right? Uh, when you actually apply it to existing research. But I also wanted to talk about um, nested structures. And in the case, um, um, we want to think about uh, the person's level, right? And uh, here, this is rather crude, but let's just say you have three individuals, but two of them are in one neighborhood and another is in a, you know, a second neighborhood. Um, they are, uh, by you know, uh, empirical standards, insufficiently nested, but for this example, uh, persons are level one. They are nested within structures, such as neighborhoods, and the reason why a neighborhood is a structure is because these forces of uh, 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 markets and uh, 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 residential choice and all these other things uh, end up creating this racialized hierarchy uh, of neighborhood uh, status attainment. Um, and then at level three, you might have healthcare center because a healthcare center uh, would probably serve more than just one neighborhood. It might serve a couple or three neighborhoods or a broader vicinity. So therefore, neighborhoods are actually nested within that healthcare center. So that's how you get to the nested na nature of these different arenas in which you experience racism, and hence they become different racism classifications. So now we can think about those same racism classifications um, uh, within a hierarchical cross-classification system. And in this case, I have N for neighborhood and S for student. I'm sorry, S for school. So N for neighborhood, S for uh, school, and I is perhaps student. Um, and so you have students one through 12. Um, you can see that they are nested within neighborhoods. Right, you have, let's just say in neighborhood four, you have four students. Um, but not all of those four students go to the same school. As you can see, school uh, three has student eight in it from neighborhood three, along with the other three from neighborhood four. So this is why it's cross-classified. You have some schools serving kids from the same neighborhood, and you have some schools serving kids from different neighborhoods, right? Um, or multiple neighborhoods in this case. So we can think about this in terms of racism because um, at least structurally, the inn is a neighborhood and that neighborhood might be formed or um, at least as part of a broader stratification of neighborhood or, or spatial uh, stratification uh, based on race. 
Um, likewise with schools, it's an institution. And so that institution may be informed by um, other stratifying forces according to race and, and also the, the actual experiences of kids with racism in those schools. But then we can get a little bit more complicated. Um, and in this case, the same neighborhood uh, uh, distribution you saw in the previous slide is here. I've just inverted it. I put it below the, the school um, because I wanted to put culture. So that C is culture. So now you have neighborhood by school, by culture. And this is would be for the same kids, I through 12. All of them have different permutations, right? Different class, uh, cross-classified assignments. Um, now, in this case, uh, you would have, this is typically what we call a four-level cross-classification. I know most people are like, well, that's you don't have four levels in hierarchical linear modeling usually. Um, but in this case, think about your average three level hierarchical linear model, which your level one being individual, your level two would be um, um, cultural. Here, your level three and four are system and structure, and they actually are on the same unit of analysis. And so I invite you to read the uh, uh, what chapter that is from the, the uh, Robin Bush and Bright um, article about it. And there are some other publications out there like uh, by Pong and, and Ho, I believe, that um, actually puts, uh, to get, puts forward uh, this, this type of, of model. The reason why I'm bringing it up here is because um, it is quite possible for us to be thinking about uh, these classifications um, at the systemic and structural and cultural level, instead of only thinking mm -hmm. about them as individual level uh, uh, units or units in which individuals have experiences. In other words, we need to start coming up with measures about the school and put that in there measures about the neighborhood, put that in there. And those are readily available. But then measures about the culture um, in a way that can be estimated, the parameters can be estimated as distinct from or apart from individual level um, covariates. Um, that's something that we need to get to. And culture, of course, is pretty complicated. So, uh, which makes this model even more complicated than it looks on paper. And I can explain how we might be able to get to it. Um, there's already been uh, a pretty significant advance uh, with the uh, the uh, um, introduction of, of MEDA. I think that's how they're, they're saying that the shortened or abbreviated version of this. It's a multi-level analysis of individual heterogeneity and discriminatory accuracy. I've put two citations up here for you to consider. And basically with MEDA, you're able to think about uh, social locations and how people might be within one social location and not another. Um, but yet both social locations are uh, included. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is intersectionality. Um, and I think this type of intersectionality approach would be a very good way to think about uh, moving forward with the um, estimation of structural, systemic, and uh, a cultural racism effects um, uh, in a in in a a model that can can handle that amount of heterogeneity, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I only have a few more points here. You're okay on time. <laughs> okay, great. So um, one thing that we have not talked about is uh, time varying phenomena, and so when racism is experienced is important. Um, and now we're seeing some of these uh, models. I'm thinking about um, 
the uh, analysis at, at um, uh, Rachel Hardman's work at University of Minnesota. Um, but they're a uh, great synopsis of, of how historical and cumulative um, um, uh, experiences with racism um, need to be understood and, and better modeled. Um, I can give you a great example of, of some of these compounded effects um, in a, a later slide, but um, there, there, there needs to be a life course perspective. There also needs to be a perspective that takes in consideration um, threshold or tipping points in experiences with uh, uh, racism over life course. Um, at what point uh, does structural resilience, for example, stop um, uh, alleviating the harmful impact of an experience? Um, and then we start to see a nonlinear uh, 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 outcome related to those experiences. I often think about this when I think about Philando Castile when he was killed um, by police. And I don't know if people realize, but Philando had been stopped 46 times before he was killed on the 47th one. And so I often wonder in terms of the, the systemic racism, meaning the police agency, mm -hmm. over the life course of those stops, how does the agency change its um, uh, its disposition toward this one individual or people like him? Who who knows what the referent is? But the point is that I don't think that they responded to this person the same way the twentieth time they stopped him as they did the second time they stopped him. We need to understand um, how uh, repeated experiences either perpetuating racism or experiencing racism um, takes on um, uh, a certain uh, linearity uh, or not uh, and, and when that happens. Um, and then of course, there are some problems. Um, there are recall bias, of course, when it comes to the time varying uh, um, understandings of, of racism at any of these levels. Um, and then I also wanted to um, make a note of uh, um, Zantin et al.'s uh, uh, fundamental cause theory, which I think is also important in explaining uh, uh, to the extent we can understand those experiences as an exogenous shock, meaning that it's something that happens that then changes the, the later course of one's development or behavior. Um, so those are some time varying considerations. So I'm going to close mm -hmm. on um, this one topic of privilege. And it's something that I feel is kind of a miss within the construct validity uh, work around systemic structural and racism. So when I say construct validity, I mean, um, defining what this is and making sure what we think it is, is reflected in our empirical analyses, is captured in our empirical analyses. And in this case, um, um, while there's racism, there's also privilege. So here is an analysis of, of, of why this distinction is important. So um, we can consider this journal article, it's, it's entitled, Disparity Does Not Mean Bias, Making Sense of Observed Racial Disparities in Fatal Officer-Involved Shootings with Multiple Benchmarks. Um, the study presumes to focus on a range of benchmarks used to estimate racial disparities in officer-involved shootings from the most inclusive, which would be total population estimates like taken from the census to the most restricted, which would be arrests where officers reported the victim was violent. Um, and so the, the study contends by way of being stopped more often by police officers, black citizens risk of being involved in an OIS are inflated. So therefore a proper benchmark must account for that reality. The article subsequently makes 
evidence of racial bias contingent on finding higher black fatality odds in encounters in the universe of incidents that could reasonably require a lethal response by officers. Excuse me. After considering samples at the census, traffic stop, um, street stop, and arrest levels, and within arrests, whether they were arrested for violent crime or weapons possession as benchmarks, the authors find significant racial disparities within all benchmarks except the two most restrictive. You see those on the table at the bottom. In conclusion, they argue the notion that Black men are disproportionately killed by police appears to be based on a fundamentally flawed benchmark, and that the two most restrictive benchmarks in which no significant racial disparities were detected are the most proper benchmarks. However, I see a much different empirical contribution in the study waiting to be rescued by critical exposition of its assumptions and the juxtaposition of them with racism theory. Successfully doing so requires we first address the unsupportable assumption about temporal precedence embedded within the study's understanding of benchmarks. However unintended, the study advances the belief that if the encounter that led to a Black fatality was caused by officer racial bias and stereotypes, those instigators cease to be responsible for the interaction if at any time after the stop, the behavior of the deceased is in question. That is theoretically requiring a use of a lethal, lethal force from the officers. This asks us to believe something temporally implausible, however, that officer shootings, however justified, of Black individuals can be free of racial bias even if without bias, the life ending police stop would have never occurred. Why was not racial bias conceptualized as a pretreatment quality that is endogenous to the treatment in any subsequent outcome? This seems to repeat the same problematic assumptions of Feldman, that Feldman and others noted of similar studies. And in that case, he was talking about the Roland Fryer study. Indeed, there, there's ample evidence supporting the racialization and bias of a pretreatment condition. Um, it can arise from prior events. There's work out there. There's officer ideologies, um, implicitly, implicit bias. And at times of the day when the ability of officers to determine the racial identity of the driver is not impaired by darkness, with evidence that racial disparities in nighttime stops are insignificant. So with this understanding of anti-Black racialization in place, we can now turn our attention to a more useful two-sided conceptualization of racial bias that uh, this study's comparison really requires. And I'll just put this here. Um, this conceptualization of racial bias acknowledges it also exists as an increased likelihood that officers' decision um, to use fatal force um, um, might be less when they engage dominant groups. Um, we could then hypothesize that the racialization of privilege in officer threat perceptions is conditioned on the range of behaviors they perceive of those they encounter. Had the analysis done so, they could have inferred from this finding that racial disparities remain present in all benchmarks until they are restricted to the instances in which the perception of white victim behavior becomes threatening enough to reduce an officer's reluctance to use lethal force against white individuals, causing racially driven differential odds between them and Black families to converge. In short, a significant deviation from mean, in this case, logic uh, odds of fatality may be a com combination of both white privilege and anti-Blackness in uh, the biased construction of officers' decision to use lethal force. And so in this case, um, I want to say that it's compounded you can look at this first uh, depiction over here, this type one, and we'll just say racism, no racism, right? And so that blue line um, it be, would be white Americans, and then the orange line would be black Americans. And um, let's just say black Americans outcomes are lower because of racism. The mean here would be no racism because theoretically, whites are not experiencing the type of racism that Blacks do. But in type two, there's a privilege that's 
greater than the mean. That's greater than the no racism mean. Um, and so it is this, um, this that shaded area that we can call privilege. I want to go back to this racism, no racism assumption here. Um, it also presumes a lot of things about white populations. For example, it presumes a racelessness among white populations, right? That um, they're not experiencing any racism, so they have no race. So then racelessness becomes um, this default norm or presumption uh, for white populations. It also suggests colorblind institutions. If there is no racism, then these institutions must not be operating on the basis of race. And I don't know that um, we can say this is the case, um, um, even for white Americans. White Americans attend institutions that are attuned to their racial makeup. They are not colorblind. And therefore, there is no racelessness, even for white Americans. So then we can go on to racism privilege um, depiction on the right and see that privilege includes a return on whiteness. That's what ROW means. Privilege includes a return on whiteness net of the no racism effect. So how do we, how do we disentangle racism effect from the white privilege effect? Is it important to disentangle them? Some people would say, well, both of them are damaging to uh, minoritized populations, who cares? But um, I think there's something to be said about being able to understand, especially in this case, um, how to construct disparities. Because in this work, the authors make the faulty assumption that racial disparity um, is the indicator of racism. And even if there is no disparity, that would not preclude any racism that has taken place, whether the outcome, the impact um, exceeds that of whites or not. And so it, you know, I think a more rigorous and critical posture, methodological posture, will recognize that disparity is an arbitrary rather than rational standard for evidence for bias altogether. Given the often pre officer involved shooting origins of an officer's racial, officer's racial disposition, Estimates of officer-involved shootings of Black men are not automatically purged of their racial bias just because they fail to exceed that of whites. So somehow we need to actually measure both racism and privilege so that we can better understand what's happening when it comes to the injury and uh, death rates um, that people experience and minoritized people experience disproportionately um, uh, in policing. So just to recap and close, racism research has relied on the mere aggregation of individual level experiences with racism in symptomology to affirm the existence of macro level forces instead of measuring those forces directly. Um, they're critical questions of construct validity that must be engaged as we move towards scalable practices of racism measurement and modeling that actually measure structural, cultural, and systemic racism directly. There are forms of racism that together create an ecology of racism. We need to ask what is the structure of racism? How does culture and structure and systemic racism and interpersonal um, all work in concert or systemically, um, maybe conflatedly in some ways um, to ensure the social reproduction of, of race and racism. And then reading these studies really critically and employing critical quantitative perspectives is really necessary here because um, I don't think the field is very responsive and inviting of work on racism. Um, 
And once we uh, are able to put forward uh, advances in rigor and advances in science, um, you know, their reluctance would matter less um, to that type of work. So um, I want to end there and thank you so much for attending the talk. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions or just hear your comments, your feedback, uh, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. This is outstanding. You can see little applause hands in the <laughs> in the rooms where you can see people as well as uh, on the for for, for others um, who had their cameras off. That that was just uh, it was outstanding, and um, I took a ton of notes that I that I look forward to um, kind of going back and, and thinking more about. I want to I do want to open it up if people have questions. Um, we're a small enough group, so if you want to raise your hand, maybe we can. Um, let you voice your question. I see a question. I see one hand in in the room there. There's Dr. Ebay. <laughs> Hi. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, Dr. Johnson, that was, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, awesome. That was a phenomenal talk. Um, just like Dr. Cruz said, I was taking notes. I was actually texting her <laughs> as I was taking some of the notes because I some of what you said. Everything you said was so intriguing. Um, I really love the point that you just made about the fact that, and this is not a question, it's just more of a reflection about the fact that the presence of a disparity is an arbitrary measure of bias. I really had never thought of it that way before. And the other thing that you said that I thought was really fascinating was the need to really characterize dimensions of privilege alongside the structures of racism and that they're not, even though they interact with each other, they're not exactly the same. So I just wanted to thank you so much for really expanding my conceptualization of what constitutes racism and the, the language that you use to even describe racism was just, um, it was great. And I, I really appreciated this, this talk. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, you know, that's, that's made my day. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that's great. Other, other um, comments or questions? Dr. Cunningham, who I haven't, haven't seen in a long time. Good to see you. How are you doing? Anyway, Hello. Good. Mm -hmm. That was a great talk. Make sure I'm not echoing. Thank you. Okay. Um, that was a great talk. I, was curious about where or how you, it or if you see the area deprivation index fitting into these models, because it's used to sort of, I know, poorly, <laughs> inadequately, probably address social determinants of health. And I just wondered how you see it fitting in some of the models that you described. Hmm. Um, so here's the thing. Um, so, um, these indices and scales, I uh, think that they do quite a bit to help us understand um, from the individual's perspective, their engagement or experience with structural, systemic, and cultural racism. I, I get that. I believe that. Um, what I'm suggesting is, and I've, you know, the deprivation index um, would definitely have some of those uh, uh, environmental um, components. So to an extent, some of these, and you, you know, sometimes I've done it before where I go into the scale and I pull it apart um, and, you know, do my own principal component analysis or just make a subscale of subscale features to um, create the scale that actually reflects the domains and constructs I think are important. Um, so you can always do that. You, you know, of course, have to be committed to doing your own uh, reliability um, um, and, and internal validity estimates, but you, you can do that. Um, so, all of that stuff, I think, is is going to be helpful. Um, it's useful. Um, we just have to be very clear that a 
individual's impression of even something that's structural is not a measure of structure. Okay, we did not directly observe that structure. It is an individual. We ask the individual who we're, we're the unit of analysis is the individual. We are observing the individual, whether we're asking them about the sun or not, the cosmos, it's still the individual. Right. And so we, we've got to be very clear about it. Then think about how might we observe the actual structure for an, or a system. And here's a, a good example. I, um, I'm on the um, uh, NCES uh, 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 expert panel uh, for um, the, the new longitudinal study of high schools that's coming out of the U.S. Department of Ed. Um, and it had within um, its two, I guess, two uh, national surveys ago. So this would be the ELS, um, Educational Longitudinal Study. Um, it had a facilities checklist, meaning a person literally walked through the school grounds and checked if there were graffiti on the walls, checked if there were no doors on the bathroom stalls, checked if there were uh, 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 chains on the doors, that sort of thing. We had an actual measure of the school. And then they stopped using it. <laughs> they discontinued it with um, the the next iteration, which was just which is the HSLS of two thousand nine. So since two thousand nine, we have no eyesight into the school's physical and structural apparatus. Um, so just we we can always ask a kid, what do they think? about the school, does it feel safe? Does it feel like a prison? But we could go through and enumerate the actual structure, the built environment of that school and answer those questions directly. So that's my point. We need to start thinking that way. Um, I hope I'm not uh, babbling, but the, I hope that, no, that makes sense. Question. Like it starts off with a general picture, but what's really useful, particularly if you're going to try to figure out where you're going to target your intervention is knowing the actual structures involved in what you're trying to estimate. Correct. I agree. That sound right? Yeah, that that's a hundred percent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Maybe as maybe as folks are thinking of them, um, and feel free to put them in the chat or, or raise your hand. Um, uh, I, I, one question I had was where in 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 the model models you presented a few that you shared. Where would you say um, interpersonal? Or sorry, not interpersonal, internalized racism, either mm -hmm. intersects or fits um, within. I, I appreciated and took lots of notes on. Mm -hmm. uh, what you shared about cultural racism, but I, I did wonder how you conceptualize how I, internalized I racism. It's there. I mean, I, I would put it into the cultural realm, but um, as long as we don't lose sight of the logics and ideologies, the, the ideological structure that creates the, the cultural frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Again, it's there where people have been given a set of conditions with which to understand themselves, their communities, their families, their futures and their past, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's, uh, you know, definitely not deficit to be understanding uh, why people uh, may have internalized a lot of what, um, what ends up being harmful. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's one of the benefits of the cultural racism uh, framework is that it avoids that whole culture of poverty uh, history where somehow culture was because of a, a individual set of, of community choices uh, that 
had really no connection to opportunity. In fact, the culture of poverty thesis suggested that there was nothing policy could do <laughs> to undo the culture of poverty unless those kids were removed from those contexts by age seven. Um, I think this is a much different understanding. It basically says, no, this culture is actually uh, the contours, the framework, uh, the possibility is actually constrained by logics of racism. Thank you for that. Um, I see Amber Davis had a question in the chat. What is the role of reparations in all of this research? Mm. Easy question. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> so uh, if you, you probably can Im imagine my response will be unless behavior changes um, among those who have had privilege for generations, um, reparations is not going to fundamentally change the system of relations among groups. When I say system of relation, you know, people, just to make this point real quickly, People always say, you know, there's been progress. There's been structural. There, There is no um, slavery um, as it used to be. Um, and I always tell them I'm not interested in that definition of change. What I'm interested in is change in the system of relations. When I say change in the system of relations, I mean, slavery cannot be replaced with mass incarceration, which should not be replaced with concentrated poverty, which should not, you know. And so it's really um, whatever the bottom is, might have been slavery one year, might be mass incarceration in another era, it should not have the same order of individuals or groups, status groups. It's that order, that system of relations among status groups that I seek to change. So I, I that's the measure of progress for me. Uh, it's the system of relationships and that uh, the, definition, the definition of equality is when, uh, when all of these status groups, uh, their outcomes, the outcomes of those people and status groups becomes non-random. I mean, it becomes random. Everything becomes, you know, it's just a random order. And that's equality, randomness. Mm. Yeah. That may be an excellent, excellent final word <laughs> to, uh, to include today, unless I do want to, I think we have a couple, maybe one or two minutes, but I did want to um, shameless plug, but I'm, I'm dropping in the chat for those that really um, enjoyed Dr. Johnson's uh, time here with us today. If you want to hear more from him, he was a guest on uh, the podcast that Sarah Zetton and I host, um, Aging Fast and Slow. So I just dropped the the, the uh, episode link in the chat. Um, so feel free to, to take a listen to that. Um, and if no, if others don't have other questions, I want you to join me, maybe even un unmute uh, to join me in thanking uh, Dr. Johnson for really, a really thought provoking and just tremendous um, uh, talk with us today. So thank you so, so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. And happy Thank holidays you. to everyone. Yeah. As well, this is our holidays. last jam session for the year. Yeah. So enjoy the holiday. We will see you in 2024. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. So Johnson. Thank you. <laughs>